described the title as Medio Core. Pretty appropriate, I think. Ain't modern metal like super exciting these days? Everybody sounds so different than everybody else! Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome to SMG Viewers Comments, episode number 359, my weekly show where I try and answer your comments and questions to the best of my ability. If you've got a comment or a question about recording, guitar, amps, uh, more recording guitars and amps, that sort of stuff, by all means, leave it below. If it's cool, if I think it can help somebody, I'll be more than happy to put it on the show. So let's cut the bullshit and get right to it. I don't really think Glenn is qualified to do a review of a guitar. He's good at a lot of things. Playing guitar is not one of them. Well, Matthew, thanks so much for chiming in. I really love your logic there. Apparently, according to Matthew, I need to be a fucking guitar wizard to be able to tell if it's a fucking guitar worth buying or not. You know what? That's a fucking phenomenal idea, Matthew. By that logic, you shouldn't be able to comment on a YouTube video because apparently you suck at it. We checked out your channel. There's nothing there. How dare you comment on the quality of my video? Fucking bite me. Here's something. I might not be the world's greatest shredder. I freely admit that. I am a studio engineer first and a guitar player second. However, I will say this. I do have 27 years of experience in manufacturing. I built minivans for Chrysler and then I graduated to doing safety and training videos. I spent an awful lot of time in that paint shop creating training videos for workers so they could identify and fix defects. So if you wonder if I'm qualified or not to check out the craftsmanship and the workmanship on a guitar, especially when it comes to paint and finish, you bet your fucking ass I've got experience with that. That was literally my fucking job. You don't have to be a shred guitar player to find flaws in a paint shop. You know, Matt, I've given your comment a lot of thought, and you know what? I'm gonna make a special award for just for you. You get the dumbest comment of the month. Congratulations, you're a winner. Do you have a video on mixing bass guitar on the channel? I searched the channel and scrolled for a while, didn't see anything specific. If not, your take on it could be interesting to see. Well, I've got how to record heavy bass. That's a very popular video that got several hundred thousand views. It's definitely worth taking a look at because I do take you through some basic bass mixing techniques. Um, there's also like my review of the Dark Glass amp where we mic that up and I take a couple different approaches on that. Uh, it's not quite specifically about mixing bass, but I think it could be helpful to what you're doing. Now, the really exciting thing is, is what we've got coming up from Spectre Digital in regards to bass guitar. I can't tell you any details yet because everything's still locked down. We're embargoed from releasing anything out into the wild yet. But I can say this, it's going to take a lot of the headaches out of mixing bass guitar and it's gonna get you great results with very little effort. We're really proud of this one. I've been using it for uh, the last few months. You guys have been hearing it on pretty much every single mix I've done. And if you like the bass tones I've been getting, you really should get excited about what's coming from Spectre Digital. Glenn! Have you heard of the Eminence DV77 speakers? They are solid competition for the V30. I know Christian Cola has some content on them, even a great IR pack. Would love to see you do an in-depth review of these speakers. I've been finding myself leaning toward these more and more in my mixes, especially for rhythm tones. Love your show. The wife and I really enjoy watching. Keep up the great content. Hey Hayden, you know what? I actually do have a DV77 sitting over in my angle cab. Um, I really do need to do a show on it. I'm seriously overdue on it. But yeah, I think you're absolutely right. The DV77 is some serious competition and well overdue for some competition to the Vintage 30. Uh, that's a great thing. I like what's going on these days in terms of uh, new speaker designs and whatnot. There's some truly cool stuff coming out. We've got the DV77, we've got the Hesu Demon, we've got some of the Mototone stuff like the Greyhound. Uh, that's coming out. Uh, I really want to take a look at some of the scum backs and maybe the fanes and there's a couple other brands I want to check out I really want to get into speakers this summer and uh, just see what I can come up with because I think that's the last great frontier when it comes to guitar tone is the speaker because that's truly the most important part of your signal chain hey Glenn my country USA is facing a recession I'm sure Canada isn't far behind as supply chains and workouts seem to be affecting the globe my question under that paradigm would be how do studios weather the storm under these conditions do prices go up for recording or do they go down in order to get people through the door imagine if people are paying a lot more for food and gas survival and most likely take focus over music but I could be wrong just curious Oh, it's definitely going to be food. I mean, like, you know, this is the thing, you know, recording studios are not a necessity and that's where the funds are going to go. And as things get more and more expensive, 
food, gas, that sort of thing. Uh, with inflation and whatnot, I think studios are gonna get squeezed more and more and more. Basically, we're all fucking doomed. So if uh, your recording studio is your sole source of income, you might wanna start looking for work elsewhere. Great thing is, a lot of places are hiring, and unfortunately, that's because we lost 10% of the workforce. So there is a job market out there. Unfortunately, not a lot of these knuckleheads wanna pay a living wage, so you might be able to find work, but it might not be for anyone's benefit but the person you're working for. Hey Glenn, was wondering if you have a video on your overall workflow, how you decide where to start each mix, and the order you decide to work through everything. If not, this, this is something you'd consider doing. I know it differs for everyone, but seeing what you do, when, and why you decide to do it would really be awesome to see. Hey dude, yes indeed, I've got a full course on that. I don't have a per se individual video on YouTube for that, but I do have an at length course. It's called Mixing Metal with Free Plugins in Reaper. So if you're a Reaper guy, I show you how to download a bunch of free plugins, install them, and you can mix a whole song front to back. And I show you my entire process from mixing real drums to mixing vocals, layering and synths. And, and we, there's even a cello on that track. It's called Medusa. It's a really, really fun track to do. And uh, if you want to learn my process, yeah, definitely check it out. It's really worth the couple bucks, I'm asking. Hey kids, it's that time once again, Butthurt of the Week. Stop with downplaying how the guitar wood doesn't affect the tone based on your silly little experiment in an enclosed environment which none of us play in. The type of wood the guitar is made of definitely affects the tone. So there's no tons of evidence that it doesn't, so stop with your false information BS. Hmm, false information BS. Um, let me just read. Re hmm. Let me just read that back again for you. So there's no tons of evidence that it doesn't. So stop with your false information BS. Dude, did you just use a double negative because you just agreed with me? Yeah, you're right. There is no tons of information out there uh, that variances in solid body electrics uh, in the wood anyway will affect the tone in any kind of significant manner. In fact, I went as far as to have this guitar and another guitar built exactly the same way with the exact same hardware and pickups. And guess what? They sounded the same fucking way, you dumb shit! Look, you can say, oh, well, you're in a controlled environment. Yeah, a recording studio where bands come in and track guitar. It doesn't matter the environment you're in. That's not going to change what happens. And that is strings moving through a magnetic fucking field. There's no magic going on here. This doesn't have a soul. This doesn't have anything. It is it is ballast for the strings to react against. The tone is coming from the strings reacting with the pickups. That's what's happening there. Jim Lil did an amazing video where he got rid of the body of the guitar. Look, I understand you don't like the conclusion I came up with, but the only thing that beats a science experiment is a better science experiment. And you don't have that. You've just got your dick in your hand. People are fools to concern themselves with vacuum tubes or what the guitar is made of. What is highly important, a player of all apparently, is guitar pay. Wow, somebody certainly hasn't been paying attention now, have they? Sure, I've been going on and on about Gibson's terrible paint jobs, and that's because it was a $2,800 guitar, you stupid shit! Fuck! When it comes to tone, the most important part of the sound is going to be the speaker. It's not the tubes, it's not the tone wood, it's the fucking speaker! You want me to slow it down and see you so it even gets through to your thick fucking skull? The most important part of the guitar signal chain on an electric guitar is the speaker. There, have I said it clearly enough? Has that got through? Has your puny little mind computed it? Good! Now, when you're throwing away thousands of dollars needlessly on a high-end guitar that you certainly don't fucking need, obviously the finish is going to come into play, especially if you want to sell that guitar down the road at some point. And flaws in the finish, like hairline cracks, are no fucking good. When you're dropping thousands upon thousands of dollars on a guitar, you expect craftsmanship and you better get perfection. And if that company can't deliver the goods, then they're trash. Glenn, I feel like an idiot asking this, but I've tried taping down strings dozens of times and I feel like it's doing nothing. I've tried looking around for a close-up photo online to see what they're doing exactly with the tape, but I can't find anything. Please be patient, Emma Guitars. All right, yeah, that's from the SMG Discord. More than happy to answer your question there. Okay, uh, it, you gotta ask yourself, where are you actually applying the tape? Like, if you're doing a lead line up here, what you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna apply tape all the way up here across the strings to keep them from vibrating. Don't put the tape down here, because down here, uh, you really can't get much grip on the string and, it's, and they're just gonna keep moving. 
But if you do stuff like up above the 12th and tape off the strings you're not using, that's gonna help. If you're doing a lead line down here, you can tape here, you can tape the other strings around it, but make sure they're up on the neck to a point where the string is actually vibrating and moving a physical distance. You know, I mean, like this is the thing, if you're down on the first fret, you know, your string's not gonna move very far, but it's moving much farther at the 12th. So that's where you wanna tape it. You know, it's kind of like when you move a baseball bat, it's the same idea. You know, the part closer to your hand isn't moving that fast, but the end is moving much, much faster. Same idea here, not moving very far at the first fret, moving an awful lot at the 12th. Just keep that in mind. Good luck to you, man. Hey Glenn, forgive my stupidity for asking, but is there a point to having physical effects pedals apart from tremolo or wah when you can get the effects for a lot less or for free with software? Yeah, you know, I've had this debate with Henning and some people just like playing with pedals. I mean, like, you do get tactile feedback with them. I mean, yes, you can definitely get the same kind of effects, especially when it comes to delay, chorus, echo, all that kind of stuff. On your DAW, that's absolutely fine, but if you're into distortion puzzle, pedals, fuzzes, overdrives, and that kind of thing, you know, the solid state stuff can make um, some interesting tones. So yeah, tweaking some knobs out and whatnot um, can give you some much needed haptic feedback when it comes to that. And you know, it might help you a little bit and then you can do crazy combos and all kinds of shit. Pedals are, are a weird world, that's for sure. Um, they're not a necessity, but they can sure be an awful lot of fun. Would you recommend this for someone that can mic an amp, DI a bass, but doesn't have an acoustic kit? only have an electric one, but would prefer to save money being a uni student, and my only other friend who has an acoustic kit that is used for recording lives an hour or two away. Oh yeah, the really nice compressor, it's it's fantastic, I love the thing. I mean, not only for drums it's good, but I wouldn't, wouldn't use it on an electric guitar unless you're playing clean or something like that. If you're playing distorted guitar, you definitely do not need to compress the signal. Now it is going to be great on acoustics, that's for sure. You might want to try using it, say if you're recording a vocal or whatever, because you can use it to clamp down on the signal on the way in. You'll need an external preamp outside of your interface, something that sits on its own, so you can go from preamp to compressor to interface, and that'll get your peaks under control. That's what I'm doing right here. I mean, I'm using a distressor backer. Hey! And it definitely uh, clamps down on the signal and keeps me from getting overs. That's the same kind of thing you can use when you're recording your vocals with an FMR compressor. It's a great entry into the world of outboard. I highly recommend checking it out. Hello, Glenn. I've recently decided that I want to get some outboard gear for my home studio. I was wondering, what are your top must-have first things to buy when it comes to outboard gear? Compressor EQ preamp. Right now, all I have is a Focusrite 18i 23rd gen running into my computer. Any suggestions would be greatly appreciated. You know, the preamps in that Focusrite are gonna be absolutely fine, man. You really don't need anything better. As we explored on the uh, Recording Engineer Roundtable we did there a couple weeks ago, a lot of preamps these days, even the cheap ones that you get on the focus rates are absolutely fine and miles above what you used to be able to get back in the 70s and 80s. Seriously, you don't need to be dropping tens of thousands of dollars onto preamps. It's just nonsense at this point. You can, sure you can get some flavor ones, but unless you're using them as fuzz pedals, you really don't need them. As for outboard though, I mean like a good outboard compressor is, is a good idea. Yeah, the FMR really nice compressor is great. The Art Pro VLA2, that's a fantastic entry level uh, compressor. Shelly Yak is the guy who recorded Don't Fear the Reaper turned me on to that. He had this rack full of amazing gear in his LA studio and he had one of those in there. I'm like, what's that all about? He's like, oh, it's great. Check it out. And I'm like, cool. So yeah, there's that. Uh, the Tegler stuff, it makes some really high-end outboard gear for not stupid amounts of money. It's surprisingly affordable. Anything made by those guys is going to be great. My personal favorite compressors are, of course, the, uh, the Empirical Labs Distressor. Stam has an amazing 1176 that does like all the different revs and uh, so you can get variances on tones, that kind of thing. They're really cool. Just make sure they're in stock before you order them because uh, he's having a lot of supply chain issues and you might be waiting a while for one of them, but boy, are they worth the wait. They're just absolutely fantastic. But then again, that Focusrite, I don't know if it has channel inserts, so you may need to get an outboard preamp so you can have preamp, compressor, then converter. If that's the case, get the Focusrite Eyes of One. I demoed that a couple months back. Phenomenal preamp, uh, just serious bang for the buck, and it's got a great DI on it as well. You really can't go wrong with that one. Hey Glenn, got a really dumb question for you. I have two by 12 speakers rated for 70 watts at 80 ohms in my eight ohms in my box, powered by a 50 watt head. Would swapping the speakers rated for 50 watt at 8 ohm lower the amp volume required to get the speakers properly moving, or am I getting my shit mixed up here? Cheers, Glenn, and keep up the good work informing the dirty masses. No, 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 going to higher wattage speakers isn't gonna make your amp louder or quieter. That's how much power handling they're rated for, uh, meaning how much you can crank the amp before you blow the speakers up. That's basically what that is. But that being said, you know, greenbacks are only 25 watts and you know, you can crank the living shit out of them and they can definitely take a pounding. That's for sure. When they go outside that, that rating, that's when the tone gets really interesting on those things. So there is that to keep in mind. 
Yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about power ratings on your amps or your speakers. Just fucking turn it up till it sounds good. And is it loud enough? Yes. Then you've got the fucking right solution there. Um, that being said, remember the tone is in the speaker. So if you don't like the tone you're getting, you might want to try upgrading to say some EVHs or some DV 77s or some Hesu demons or something like that. There's a lot of good choices out there for speakers. Don't be afraid to mess around with those and try and find some, something cool that works for you uh, because life did not end at the vintage 30. Hey Glenn, two questions here. How often do you come up with new merch ideas on the shop? Order myself the SMG logo coffee mug as a college graduation gift for myself. And I thought of the SMG logo reading bass player tears instead. If you were to take any idea for potential merch, would bass player tears or anything be similar or fitting? Also, when it comes to actual production, I have always thought the process of recording, mixing, and mastering is something that generates technique varying from person to person. If I compare and contrast the techniques from Frederick Nordstrom to Andy Sneap and Peter Targan, you'll see what I mean. As do you think developing some great production techniques is sort of a happy accident through experimentation or something you learn from others over time? Wow, that was a mouthful. Holy fuck, man. Uh, thanks for keeping your question short and to the point. Um, on the merch thing, yeah, Bass Player Tears might be a fun coffee mug. Um, maybe we can make that happen at some point. Thanks for the idea. As for production, yeah, I think it's a combination of both. You learn what you can from your friends. I mean, like, that's what we did with the Andy Sneap Forum is, you know, everybody, you know, kind of threw the, some ideas out. Hey, check out my mix, check out my mix, check out my mix. And we got a ton of feedback and it was great. And that's why that forum did so well uh, for such a long time until Joey Sturgis had a, had a uh, hit. And then all of a sudden it was, a, what are Joey's presets? What are Joey's presets? Presets, presets, presets. And then it became, you know, that was the beginning of the carbon copy metal movement. Uh, as I, I like to refer to it as. Um, so that can only take you so far. A lot of it does have to go through experimentation and happy accidents and all that sort of stuff. And believe me, I think, I don't think, you know, Nordstrom or uh, Bob Rock came up with the on and on axis 57 uh, technique, you know, on purpose. I think it was probably just like something got knocked at some point. Like, hey, that sounds kind of neat. What happens if we apply it this way? What happens if we try pairing it up with another mic facing the right way? You know, I'm sure that that's how that came from. I'm sure a lot of our studio techniques came from some guessing and probably a few drinks were involved as well. So there is that. Being on a Spectre binge as of late and I enjoy your no-nonsense, fuck your feelings approach to presenting information. Plenty of people just want to hear their own opinions echo back to them instead of hearing what they need here. Keep it up and F you. Well, thanks, man. Uh, I really do appreciate the vote of confidence there. Um, after getting hammered in the comments all the time, it's nice to get um, a, a comment or two supporting the channel. I'm glad I can keep you guys entertained. I'm glad I can inform as well and hopefully challenge some of your preconceptions about recording and where we're going with all of that. And this is the thing, you know, you guys keep me on my toes too as well. I don't want to just hear an echo chamber either. I don't want to hear just a bunch of fanboys and whatnot. If somebody's got something cool and can present evidence that is going to challenge my uh, my own conclusions, I'm all for it. But that's the thing. It's not just, well, when I play it, it's different. No, no, no. Show me. Show your work and prove it. The problem we have today is what I call agony of choice. We have so many options that it becomes easy to think that the next plugin, piece of gear, throw more money at, will somehow solve our problems and make us sound great, write great songs, etc., etc. Do yourself a favor. Limit yourself to the most basic tools, like only use DAW inbuilt effects and a single amp sim to make music for a set pe time period, say a month or two, even more. Get to know how those tools work, how you can get the most of them. It may sound weak and stupid, but being limited to a few pieces of gear will focus you. Hmm. Few pieces of gear, you say? Now, actually, I'm in, I'm in complete agreement with you. I mean, like when I was coming up in the 90s, yeah, I didn't have racks and racks of gear or amps or any kind of thing. I had a dual rectifier and uh, like a Vintec Dual 72, and that was about it. And that's what I had to work with. And I did the best I could with what I had. And I'm sure that a lot of us are still doing that. The great thing is though, you can get amp sims that are gonna sound wonderful right out of the box. Um, so those of you guys who don't know what to buy, I'd say, you know, if you want, if you don't know what you're doing and you wanna just have something that sound good right out of the box with minimal dicking around, yeah, the uh, Amp One, from Bogren Digital is definitely a very good choice. I've got a Fearless Gear review on it on the show. It should have been released by now, and if you haven't seen it, I'd highly recommend checking it out. I can definitely help you get a good tone. I'd say, yeah, if you don't know what to get, start there and work with that for a good six months before you branch out into other amp sims and kind of find your own thing. But the trick is, you do want to keep learning and branch out and not just stick with the tried and true because the tried and true becomes boring and still pretty fucking quick. Glenn, I love the way you read the comments out. I can understand what's being said perfectly fine. I was the ones that found it dull and boring when you used to read them out at a normal pace. Since you've been doing it like this, this is what separates Spectre viewers' comments out there from other YouTube content creators' Q&A shows. It brings a unique vibe to a staple show that a lot of content creators produce to engage with their audience. Also, it's a brilliant way to convey the humor and stupidity, particularly in the Butter of the Week segment of what some people come out with. I don't play much guitar anymore, fuck you very much, rheumatoid arthritis, and by extension, I no longer do studio recordings of my work. However, I still watch the show because it has excellent entertainment value. Kia Ora from New Zealand. 
Ah, oh, dude, so sorry to hear about the arthritis stuff. That's uh, really got to suck. But I do appreciate you sticking with me all this time. I mean, like, yeah, the first few viewers' comments, I just read the comments at a, a normal pace. And I thought, yeah, let's speed things up and get the show moving a little bit more. I mean, dude, you've been watching this show for 359 episodes. Dude, you have my utmost respect. Wow, thank you so much for sticking with me for all this time. You, sir, fucking rock. I'm able to understand the comments, and I'm a fucking baguette eater. <laughs> well, congratulations, dude. Uh, baguettes are great. I remember eating them several years ago. Uh, definitely not keto these days, that's for sure, which is unfortunate, but they are fucking delicious, that's for sure. Uh, anyway, yeah, hey, thanks so much for writing in. I love the fact that people all over the world watch this show. That really does make my fucking day. And uh, so to everybody all across the world who does watch this, I just want to say thanks for sticking with me. Thanks for watching the show. You guys keep watching them. I'll keep making them. Uh, once again, for those of you guys who are interested in my whole workflow and whatnot, check out my Mixing Metal with Free Plugins course. You can follow the link in the description below and pick yourself up a copy. It's definitely worth checking out. Anyway, that's it for this episode. Thanks again for subscribing. Thanks for watching. All that good stuff. Please keep those comments and questions coming because I love hearing from you guys. Anyway, until next time, have a wonderful weekend and get out there and make some metal while praising Crom and crushing your enemy.